Hey, welcome to the uh, next lecture. So our, <clears throat> I'm happy to introduce uh, Fernando Marquez from Princeton, and he's going to tell us about the space of cycles, a Viles formula for minimal hypersurfaces, and Morse index in estimates. Hey, thanks, Rick. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. I have great respect for JDG. Uh, my, th my thesis was published in JDG, and I was very happy back then. Uh, so it was, it was some but partial result towards compactness for the Amabi problem. And then we finished the problem in another paper published by JDG. So I was quite honored when some years ago I was invited to, to become an editor of JDG. So it's a real honor to be here in this celebration. Uh, okay, so, so let me start by recalling this beautiful result of, of Weil. So Weil in, Hermann Weil in 1911 proved this beautiful formula uh, relating, uh, well, determining the asymptotics of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian uh, in terms of purely the volume of the manifold. So the formula is the following. I hope, I hope you'll, you'll see what I write back there. Uh, 1911. So he proved that uh, one way of formulating is the limit of lambda p times p to the power minus 2 over n plus 1 equals uh, some dimensional constant times the volume of m to the power minus 2 over n plus 1, uh, where m has dimension n plus 1 is a compact Riemannian manifold, and the lambda p's of m, they form the spectrum of the Laplacian of m. So this is the, the spectrum of the Laplacian. So maybe this is a little bit unusual for some of you because first of the, the ambient dimension is n plus one, and also some most often people write the formula in terms of the counting function. But I assure you that this is correct. Um, so the story goes that uh, Lawrence proposed this problem in some distinguished lectures that he gave uh, in Göttingen, uh, Germany. And uh, David Hilbert was in the audience, and he said that he would not see a solution in his lifetime. So apparently, Hermann Weyl was also in the audience, and he was a graduate student at the time. He came, uh, found a solution just one year later. So this is the uh, famous uh, Weyl's law. So I claim that there is a Weyl law uh, for which the eigenvalues of the Laplacian are replaced by areas, by the areas of minimal hypersurfaces. And these minimal hypersurfaces are constructed by minimax methods. So, so recall that lambda p can be given a minimax characterization. Uh, so you can define this by the inf of the soup. So you take all p-dimensional planes, q, inside, say, the Sabalev space of your manifold, so dimension of q equals p, and then you take the supremes over all functions, non-zero functions in q, of the Rayleigh, Rayleigh functional, so this is e of f, which is just the integral of the gradient of f square divided by the integral of f square in your manifold. So we'll come back to this later. So in the late 80s, uh, Gromov uh, was playing around with some applications of the classical Borsukulan theorem. Uh, so the Borsukulan theorem says that if you have a continuous map from the n-dimensional sphere to the n-dimensional Euclidean space, then uh, there is a pair of antipodal points which have the same image. Uh, so he thought about the following application. So you take, say, a domain uh, in Rn plus 1. 
And then you look at the space of functions, you know, omega. So inside that space, you take a vector subspace of dimension k plus 1. So E is a vector subspace. Uh, and then inside this space, you take the k-dimensional uh, sphere with respect to some, some norm. And then for every function uh, in this k-dimensional sphere, you can associate the following element of Rk. So you take the volume of the set where u is negative intersected with omega 1. So I forgot to say that you also have to choose uh, k disjoint subregions of omega. So you look at the volume of where u is negative intersected with omega 1 and so on. So volume where u is negative intersected with omega k. So this is a map from sk to, to rk. And the assertion that there is a pair of multiple points which have the same image is basically the assertion that you can find some function in this sphere uh, so that the zero set of u naught, it's the set of points where u naught is equal to zero, uh, bisects each omega i into two regions of equal volume. So if you choose, say, a cube inside omega, and then inside that cube you, you choose k uh, subcubes such that the, the size is of order k to the power minus 1 over n plus 1, you can use the isoparametric inequality for each of those little cubes and conclude that just it's an easy consequence of the isoparametric inequality that the area of the zero set of u naught is at least some constant times k to the power 1 over n plus 1. Okay, so given any k-dimensional sphere of functions, there is a function in the sphere such that the zero set has large area and it grows like this power of, of k. So this is a first instance of some kind of similarity between the two things. So, so here's the, the idea. Uh, well, the first observation is that if you look at the Rayleigh functionals, then, of course, if I multiply my function by some constant c, the energy is the same for every c real number minus 0. So the functional actually descends to the projectivization of the Sobolev space. So you can think of E as defined as the projectivization of W12 of M into the reals. Uh, well, of course, the, the two settings, setting of eigenfunctions of the Laplacian and minimal hypersurfaces in Riemannian manifolds, they seem uh, dramatically different, but actually they share some deep topological principles which are basically the, the reason these formulas are true. So the idea is that you want to replace the, uh, so this is like an RP infinity. And then you want to replace that projectivization by the space of hypersurfaces in your manifold. So my notation is the following. So you take Z n of m, n plus 1 with z2. So informally, this is the space of unoriented closed hypersurfaces in m. Of course, more technically, you can use geometric measure theory to make sense of this space. This is the space of n-dimensional uh, flat chains modulo two flat chains, this is important, uh, T in M with boundary equal to zero. So this is what I refer to as the space of, of cycles of, of your manifold. And then uh, it turns out that that space is weakly homotopically equivalent to RP infinity. This is the wrong guy. 
which is the best. That's fine. So it turns out that if I take the space of cycles, this is actually weakly homotopically equivalent to arp infinity. So actually, that space could have more than one uh, connected component. So you take actually the connected component that contains the origin, sorry, the, the zero cycle. And for every t belonging to that connected component, you know that t is going to be the boundary of an n, n plus one dimensional chain. So you take that connected component. This is going to be weakly homotopically equivalent to, to RP infinity. And uh, actually, although Almgren did not observe this, it follows from the work of Almgren in 1960. What Almgren did was he computed the homotope groups of the space of, of cycles. He did it with integer coefficients, but the same proof holds for, for Z2. Uh, and then it follows from his calculation that pi 1 of this space is equal to Z2, and all the higher homotope groups are trivial. So this is the exact list of homotope groups of, of RP infinity. Uh, some other, there's another way to see this kind of RP infinity uh, structure, which is you think of, if you take the space of chains of dimension n plus one, so this is my notation for the space of chains of top dimension, you can think of the boundary operator which is going to give me a cycle, dimension m. So if you take a cycle t, so t is the boundary of some u, but it's also the boundary of m minus u. And these are the only two possibilities by the constancy theorem in geometric measure theory, because I'm taking coefficient z2. And then you can think of the map alpha, which sends u into m minus u as some kind of antipodal map And of course, this space of the top dimensional chains, one can prove that is contractible. So this is like some infinite dimensional sphere where there is an antipodal map. So this is a double cover so that has an RP infinity uh, structure. Okay. Um, in order to see that the space of chains is contractible, it's easy because you can choose some most function f, and then if you give me some region omega, I just consider the, the deformation which sends omega into the intersection of omega with the sublevel set of t. So this gives me a retraction onto the zero, zero cycle. So, so if you use coefficients in z2, you have this rich uh, structure. And z2 is actually very important. If, if instead of z2, you choose, you choose the integers, if I replace this by, by z, that space is going to be actually the circle, okay? So, which is kind of disappointing because it's telling you that there are no non-trivial families in dimensions bigger than one. But suddenly, if you choose z2, you see this rp infinity. And of course, there are rpks here of every k. So there are non-trivial uh, sweep outs of, for any number of, of parameters. So you want to mimic the min-max characterization of the eigenvalues of the Laplacian. Uh, but of course, you lose. This is a Hilbert space, right? So you have a linear structure here. When you go to the space of cycles, you lose that linear structure. So you have to somehow define a nonlinear version of the eigenvalue. You cannot talk about uh, affine spaces there. So what you do is the following. You look at the cohomology. So the cohomology of RP infinity with coefficients z2. It's just the polynomial ring over z2 generated by a single element of degree one. Okay. So, so you, can, you can call lambda bar, you can take lambda bar to be the generator of the first cohomology group of the space of cycles.
with coefficients in Z2. So this guy is Z2. So you take lambda bar to be the, the generator. And then you say that if you have a family of cycles, you say that this family is a P sweep out if uh, it detects the uh, pth power of lambda bar with respect to the cup product. So, oops, I lost that one. So if lambda bar to the power p when restricted to the, to the family, it's non-trivial. So this is the definition. So once you have the right definition, you can define uh, omega, you can define the, the nonlinear eigenvalue. This is going to be the, the mimax number associated to that class. So of course, I, s I forgot to say, you want to replace the, this projective space by the space of cycles. And of course, you also want to replace the energy by the, by the volume, which is called the mass, the n-dimensional volume. OK, like in Gromov's example. So you take, for each, for each piece we power, you maximize uh, the mass of sigma, sigma in S, and then you minimize over all P sweep outs, over all families that satisfy the, the property. And then you call the sequence of numbers the volume spectrum. So this is omega 1 of m, less than or equal to omega 2 of m, and so on. So at first sight, it's not even clear whether this will grow to infinity. But actually, one can run a very similar argument to what Gromov did. So if you have a P sweep out, then given any P disjoint regions, there will be a surface in the sweep out that bisects each region into two pieces of equal volume. So you can bound the volume of that guy by the power of P. So it turns out that actually one can prove the following result. So this theorem was, I guess, originally to Gromov, but also was reproven by, by Guth recently that there are constants C1 and C2 positive, depending on them, such that one has that the P width, this is called the P width, grows like this power. Okay, so th that's the result. So I gave a hint of how one can prove the, the lower bound. If you want to prove the upper bound, you can think of the following example. You take, say, the ball in Euclidean space, you look at the family of all polynomials of degree less than or equal to d. And then for each polynomial, you associate its zero set. Then you see that uh, the, the area of the zero set is proportional to the degree d, whereas the dimension of the family grows like a power of d. So it turns out that that example gives you precisely this, uh, this rate. Um, and then, I think, in the, in the 1988 paper, Gromov was quite close to, to conjecturing the viola because he was, he was talking about violas in some other settings. But anyway, the explicit conjecture, I guess, we can find in a paper of 2003, is that the sequence, the volume spectrum, obeys the vial law. Uh, and that's what we, we proved recently. So let me state the result here. OK, so, so this theorem is joined with Yokomovich, he's a postdoc at MIT, and Andre Nevis says that there exists a dimensional constant, positive constant, which depends only on the dimension, uh, such that if I take the limit 
of omega p of m divided by or multiplied by p to the minus 1 over n plus 1. This is equal to this dimensional constant times the volume of m to the right power, which in this case is n over n plus 1. OK, so this is the, this is the vial law. So this holds for any uh, Riemannian manifold. So differently from the case of eigenfunctions, we cannot compute the constant, because it's very hard to come up with uh, examples, uh, sharp examples here. So in the case of the eigenvalues, you can look at the torus and compute the constant there. But here is different. We don't know what the constant is. But anyway, it's a universal uh, constant. So the reason we actually, I am interested in the sequence of numbers, the volume spectrum, basically interested in this guy, is motivated by a conjecture of Yao. So, so this conjecture, I guess, is formulated in 82. So this is the first problem in the minimal surface sections uh, of the list of problems of Yao in 1982. The conjecture was stated like this, that every compact three-dimensional manifold uh, should contain infinitely many uh, minimal surfaces, uh, smooth, immersed, closed, minimal surfaces. So this is kind of similar to a famous conjecture about closed geodesics, that there should be infinitely many closed geodesics. So in some cases, this is the dual problem. When you're looking at co-dimension one uh, submanifolds, so I think at the, at the time this conjecture was stated, there was the, the work of Elmgren and Peetz who developed this MIMAX theory, this whole machinery. And the, the best result at the time was that every uh, compact Riemannian manifold contains at least one minimal surface. So this was the best result until recently when we proved together with Andre Neves the following results a few years ago that first in general, actually this conjecture, I mean, the dimension three is there, but it should be true in any, in any dimension. And what we proved was that first, for general M, uh, there's always N plus one minimal surfaces. And the minimal hypersurfaces are embedded, okay? So they are going to be, uh, they're going to be closed, minimal hypersurfaces which are smooth embedded outside a singular set of small dimension. Co-dimension seven, so in this case would be dimension n minus seven. Okay, so as I said, Almgren Pitts developed a theory to prove the existence. The irregularity in higher dimensions uses Shen Simon theory. So in general, there's always at least n plus 1. But if the Ricci curvature is positive, we can prove that there are infinitely many. So if the Ricci curvature of m is positive, there are infinitely many uh, minimal hypersurfaces. And they are embedded, always embedded. So, so Yao's conjecture is true for the positive uh, Ricci curvature uh, setting. And the, the idea was that we uh, decided to look at the situation was with Z2 coefficients. So we have the uh, volume uh, spectrum. And then the theory of Elmgren and Peetz So they developed this MIMAX theory, which is quite involved. But in particular, we will imply that each of those numbers, so omega p of m, is achieved as the area of a minimal hypersurface. But that hypersurface can have more than one connected component, and each component can come with multiplicity. Okay, so the result is that omega, each omega p is going to be of the following 
form, so multiplicity, say MP1, sigma P1 plus maybe some LP here, sigma P LP, where where the these guys are disjoint. Sigma P LP is a disjoint family because the surfaces are embedded, so they have to be disjoint of minimal hypersurfaces. And the MIs are, are integers. So it's a kind of subtle thing that the, this theory is based on the space of cycles, which uh, technically is the space of, of chains. But when you try to approach your minimal hypersurface, you have to take uh, the, the topology of given by verifolds. So you have to use verifolds also. And then even if you take Z2 coefficients, because in this convergence, you just look at the, at the verifold, you might get a, a positive integer there, okay? So, so which makes things difficult. So the basic difficulty of the theory is that you have this possibility of, so when you're approaching minimal surface, you could be developing a small neck, and then you're getting two times, say, a surface uh, in the limit. So this is the phenomenon of multiplicity. So what made things uh, simpler in the case of positive Ricci curvature is the fact that, so if, you ha if one has positive Ricci curvature, then there is this theorem of Frankel which says that any two minimal hypersurfaces have to intersect. Therefore, because this collection is disjoint, there's, the surface is connected. Okay, so this implies that omega P of M is always a single multiple of a connected guy. So this simplifies things considerably. One can actually, so we, we had to adapt some ideas uh, from lucernich schneerman theory together with some counting arguments to get a contradiction with the sublinear growth if one assumes that there are only finally many surfaces, minimal surfaces. So it's a contradiction argument based actually on that, on this uh, estimate. But in general, one can have more than one component and here one can prove actually there are, there's always n, at least n plus one. There's no, it's not a coincidence that n plus one is precisely uh, the inverse of that, of that power. Anyway, this is the reason why we got interested in the volume spectrum. Let me just say a few words about the proof. Okay, so maybe I should erase this. So the basic, just a minute. Okay, so can you hear me? So the basic inequality, we call it the Lusternik Schneerman inequality. says the following thing, that if you have, if you have a region uh, omega, and then you have a bunch of subregions omega i, then one can relate the volume spectrum of omega with the volume spectrum of the subregions. I should say that, at this point, I should say that our theorem works for manifolds with boundary as well. Okay, it's important because the proof actually uses manifolds with boundaries. So of course, if the manifold has boundary, then we, one has to talk about relative cycles. So these are cycles such that the boundary of T is contained in the boundary of M. It turns out that again, you have this RP infinity uh, structure. So let me say that I think recently, Shinjo, which is probably present in the, in the audience, he, uh, 
developed a mimex theory for manifolds with boundary, and then the idea is that these surfaces will be orthogonal. They'll, they'll, they'll be free boundary minimal hypersurfaces. So there is a mimex theory for manifolds with boundary. Anyway, the inequality says, again, that if you have, a, say, a domain in Rn plus 1 and a bunch of subregions, so it says that omega p of the big region uh, is greater than or equal to the sum of the omega of pi's of omega i if provided the sum of the pi's is less than or equal to p. So let me prove this because it's based on the, uses the cup product structure so you can see why it's useful. So, so the idea is uh, you take a P sweep out of omega, so you take a, a family S which is contained in the space of relative cycles of omega with respect to the boundary, coefficients in Z2. And then you assume that when you look at the fundamental cohomology class, that lambda bar uh, to the power P restricted to S is non-trivial. So this is a, a P sweep out. And then you look at the following subfamily. Let, let us call it SI. This is the space of T's in the family S, such that when I look at the mass of T in the omega I region, this is strictly less than the PI width of that region, so omega PI. So you look at this uh, family, at this, at this subfamily, Uh, and then you observe that if you take uh, some element T in the big family and you restrict it to omega i, so you have a relative cycle of the big region, and now here you have a relative cycle of the smaller region, omega i, you observe that this preserves the cohomology class. So why is that? The cohomology class has degree one, and it has a geometric meaning. So the idea is that if you have a one-parameter uh, sweep out of your region, the cohomology class evaluated at that family is going to give you one if the family sweeps out the whole thing, and it's going to give you zero if, if the family is trivial. So the idea is that if you have a, a hypersurface, and you, then you have a one-parameter family of hypersurfaces, then you, you want to keep track of the region that it spans. So this is going to be an n plus one dimensional region. And then either, because we're taking coefficients in Z2, when you keep track of this region, either it's going to be the whole thing or it's going to be equal to zero. But of course, if I have my family and I restrict it to, to the, the smaller guy, then the family is going to be non-trivial in the smaller guy if and only if it is non-trivial in the big one. So, so this restriction preserves the fundamental homology class, uh, but in the subfamily we are below uh, the, P, the PI width. So therefore, when I take the lambda r to the power PI restricted to that subfamily, this has to be equal to zero by definition, right? Although, because I'm below uh, the critical number. So then by the basic property of cup product, you get that lambda bar to the power P1 plus Pn, when restricted to the, the union of the subfamilies, this has to be equal to zero. But then I'm assuming that this sum is less than or equal to P. Therefore, lambda bar of the P restricted to the union is equal to zero. So this is telling me that I can find so this means that I can find an element T which is not in the union, right? Because I have these two informations. So then it's easy to estimate the mass. So the mass of T, of course, is bounded from below by the sum of the masses of the restrictions. I going from one to N. 
but t does not belong to, to S i, so, so this has to be at least the sum of the omega p i's. Okay, so this is the, this is the proof of the uh, Lewis and Schneerman inequality. Okay, so once you know this, I'm not gonna go over the details here. The idea is to uh, use packing arguments. So first you prove the viola for the, for the cube, then you have to use, you can pack it with, with similar cubes here. So you prove the vial law for the cube. Then given a domain, you can pack a domain with subcubes, and then you prove the result for the, for the limb inf. But you can reverse roles. You can, pack a you can pack a cube with copies of your domain, and then you prove this for the limb soup. You have to be a little bit smart with the, with the choices. But that's how you prove it for domains in the Euclidean space. So when you go to uh, Riemannian manifolds, uh, then of course you can pack a Riemannian manifold by very small geodesic balls, which look basically Euclidean. So for Riemannian manifolds, you can prove the result for the limb inf using the same idea. But you cannot pack a cube with Riemannian manifolds. So the argument does not work for the limb soup where M is a Riemannian manifold. So that requires a different argument. Just mention very briefly the idea here. So this is assuming that we have already proved the formula for, for Euclidean domains. Then if, when, if you have a Riemannian manifold, the idea is that you use a triangulation of M by CI guys. So the triangulation can be chosen to be uh, sufficiently fine so that each element of the triangulation, each triangle here, is a one plus epsilon by Lipschitz to a domain uh, in the Euclidean space. So what you do is you have these finitely many domains in the Euclidean space, you translate them, and then you create some artificial omega, which is going to be a connected sum of these guys. So it's going to look like this. So, so you build this artificial domain, like this, small tubes, so you can choose the tubes here so that the, the volume stays almost the same. So the volume of omega is basically, say, 1 plus epsilon, the volume of M. And then you already know the, the vial law for domains in Euclidean space. So basically, you can choose a sweep out of your domain omega, which is almost optimal with respect to the vial law. And then you'd like to transplant your sweep out to a sweep out of, of M. So the problem is that when you look at the sweep out, you, you see these hypersurfaces, maybe they, they could go into the, the tubes, something like this. So this would be one hypersurface in the, in the sweep out. So the naive thing would be to translate these guys, but of course this does not work because if I do this, then I have no guarantee that this is going to be a cycle. Right? The boundary will be, will be non-zero. So the idea is that instead of looking at the, at the hypersurfaces, you look at the, at the region it bounds. Okay, so you look at this guy. And then you want to transplant the region. So you look at the, you transplant the region, and then you take the boundary of that region. So you get something like this. So of course this is a cycle, because the boundary of the boundary uh, is equal to zero. So that you can do. But of course, there are two different regions uh, that one can choose. So you have to use, it goes through a, a topological argument. Basically, you see this as a double cover. And then this double cover is classified by precisely uh, the, the cohomology class. So one can actually show that once you choose one region here, there's a canonical way of choosing a region uh, there and here. 
so that one can actually transplant these regions, get a piece sweep out here uh, in M. And then when you compute the, the, the mass, of course, the, the interior piece will get distorted by very little, but then you're adding this hypersurface here. Which, but the good, the good thing is that it's completely contained in the n minus one dimensional skeleton. And we are using coefficients in Z2. So you have a bound. So the mass of the piece which is contained in the skeleton is bounded by some fixed constant C. So when you divide, you want to divide, of course, by P1 over n plus one, of course, when you let p go to infinity, that constant goes to zero, and you you're actually be able to prove the result for m. So that's more or less the idea. Okay, so so I'd like to finish with some some words about Yao's conjecture. Okay. Of course, one, one idea would be to, you know, you have, this, you have this vial law, so you assume that you have only finitely many minimal hypersurfaces, so you might think that if you perturb a little bit the metric uh, on the complement of those surfaces, you're going to change the volume, so you're going to think that maybe you, you, you violate, you get a contradiction with the vial law, but it's subtle because when you perturb a little bit your, your, your manifold, you know, Minimal, minimal hypersurfaces can appear suddenly. So they could appear, could appear some guy with index 500, and then there's no way to take a limit of those guys. So, so it's a little bit subtle. Anyway, one way to, to study the problem is to look at the Morse index and, of course, multiplicity. So I'm going to state some theorems that we have proved recently some conjectures and also some work in progress. Uh, so first of all, we proved a few years, maybe one or two years ago, that uh, if you have, say, sigma, sigma might be something like this. So suppose that this guy is a Mimax minimal hypersurface, uh, and this Mimax is done with some number of parameters, then one can prove that, uh, so theorem with Nevis, we prove that the sum of the index of the support, in other words, the sum of the indices of the components, is bounded from above by k, where k is the number of parameters. In particular, if you use the k width, you're going to get a minimal hypersurface with index bounded uh, from above by, by k. So this is a theorem. So we have, of course, the one good thing about the theorem is that it actually allows multiplicity. But of course, the bad thing is that it, the, the definition of the index doesn't take into account the multiplicities. It's just the sum of the indices of the components. So we actually have a conjecture here. So here, our, our, base, our basic goal is to try to uh, make some stronger uh, conjectures. I mean, stronger in the sense the more precise conjectures about the surfaces, that in the end, the idea is that everything is going to be reduced to the following conjecture, which we call the multiplicity one conjecture. That we formulate, actually, let me put it here, a slightly stronger one. So we conjecture that if you have, so for a generic metric, for a generic metric, and generic here means bumpy. Remember, the bumpy means that every uh, minimal hypersurface uh, is non-degenerate, critical point of the area functional, so there are no Jacobi fields. So for, and Brian White proved that the space of such metrics is uh, bare generic. So 
we conjecture that every component of a min-max uh, minimal hypersurface uh, is two-sided uh, and has multiplicity one. So there is the danger that you could be producing a, a one-sided guy. These guys appear, they have to appear with multiplicity by a result of Shinzhou. So we rule those out uh, in this conjecture. So what, I should say, work in progress. So actually, we, we made some prog progress on that conjecture, but kind of slow. So in the one-parameter case, at least if the component is two-sided, we have proved that the multiplicity is one. Uh, and in some settings, we, we can also rule out the one-sided guy. Okay. But what we, pr we are proving in general is that first, if the component, uh, if the component is stable, then the multiplicity is one. And we're also proving that I mean we're writing this up. We also prove that the sum of the indices uh, is greater than or equal to, to k. We prove the upper bound over there, but it's greater than or equal to k if the multiplicity is one. Okay, so, so the idea then is if you combine the multiplicity one conjecture with this work in progress, you should prove the following result that uh, for any, for a generic metric, on M, there should be a sequence of minimal surfaces, sigma K, uh, minimal hypersurfaces with the property that first the index of sigma k is equal to k, uh, precisely k, and the area. These are, these are is going to follow from the vial law, so the area of sigma k divided by k to 1 over n plus 1 converts to this dimensional constant times the volume of n. So this is what we expect uh, to be true, again, uh, assuming that one can come up with the proof of the multiplicity one conjecture. Okay, so I'll finish here, and thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? What, sorry? Yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, they're going to be uh, smooth up to a small singular set of co-dimension seven. Yeah, yeah. Well, we are proving that, right? I mean, it's work in progress. Uh, it's uh, if you if you know our our work on the one parameter case, it's basically uses the, the the collapsing argument. So if you're familiar with, I think you are familiar with that. So so we can actually do it for k parameter too. Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we, we expect that these guys will become uh, dense in the manifold, right? And the, the argument for the, for the lower bound suggests this, because it tells you that if you have a k-sweep out, then there's always, given k distinct regions, right? There's always a surface that passes through those regions. But that surface might not be the, the one with maximum area. 
it's, the area is almost maximal, but maybe not the, the, the one with maximum area. So, I mean, certainly it's suggestive that these guys will become dense, but the argument doesn't quite give that. <coughs> Let me ask one, <clears throat> one question. If you, if you took the standard metric on S3 and perturb it a little bit, can, do you know what happens to the minimal uh, uh, surfaces? Yeah, in that case, one would have a positive Ricci curvature. So, so, so you have infinitely many anyway. We have infinitely many, uh, but we don't have the, the index thing there for k parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah, so of course, this guy will be connected, right? And one should expect that the index will be equal to k. Uh, and actually, even for the, for the round metric, maybe you don't get every k here, but you should be getting this kind of area behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, because the idea is that uh, maybe you, you, you don't have every k here because you have isometries, right? So that they contribute to nullity. But it's somehow uh, the, only way, the only way you can generate nullity is by isometries. I mean, th those gaps should be bounded, and then you should get at least the, this should be true with some gaps, and this, the, and the area growth would be the same. But of course, I mean, we're not, we're not aware of a construction of this hypersurface, even for the round metric in S3. Okay. Um, other questions? If not, let's thank Fernando again for a beautiful talk.